All righty, we're going to go ahead and get started here. So good afternoon, everyone. Who here hates war? Yeah, me too. Um, but I didn't always uh, used to feel that way. My name is Derek Pru. I'm a former sergeant in the New Hampshire Army National Guard. And today we're going to be talking about a piece of legislation. But before we do that, the opinions that you're about to hear today do not represent those of the United States Army, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. And I am joined here by an individual who made constitutional carry pass in Maine, the 2012 Maine campaign director for Ron Paul, and former state senator from Maine, Eric Brakey. And I am also joined by an individual that I just met, met this weekend at Porkfest, another National Guardsman, Illinois Staff Sergeant, Illinois National Guardsman Staff Sergeant Mitch Mitchell. All right, how do we want to get started? Uh, so to get started, I'm going to go ahead and just give a little bit of background on how I got involved with Defend the Guard, which is this legislation that we're going to be talking about today. Um, so I joined the New Hampshire Army National Guard when I was 17 years old, still in high school. And, you know, I wanted to uh, not only serve my country, but also serve my state. That's why I went with the National Guard. I wanted to be called up for snowstorms and get out there with plows and shovels and help people out, you know, throw salt down. I wanted to, to help pull people out of the snow, um, you know, natural disasters, uh, do a lot of community service work because um, I really like the people around me in my community and that's who I wanted to serve. So I went ahead and joined the New Hampshire Army National Guard and I discovered that over the last 20 years with the global war on terror, 60% of all units deployed are National Guard units. Mm. So our teachers, cops, uh, neighbors, uh, husbands, wives, children, people that are around us in our civilian lives all the time, they were getting called up almost more than uh, the active duty who sign up to do it full time. And, uh, you know, that, that kind of hit me a little bit. And um, after a while, I, uh, you know, started discovering a few things about the military. Um, I read a story about a gentleman, he was an air, uh, airman, Daniel Hale. And he exposed that 90% of drone strikes are not on the intended target. And if they're not on the intended target, then who are they hitting? Uh, possibly civilians. Um, and that, that really messed me up a little bit, and that's kind of what started me on the path to libertarianism. And so uh, my job in the Army National Guard was I was a HIMARS crew member. HIMARS is High, Art uh, high Mobility Artillery Rocket System. So this is a big truck with a rocket launcher in the back, and we have a range of anywhere between 20 to 300 miles. So I wasn't seeing our potential enemies, and I had to trust the intel that we were given. And after seeing uh, Daniel Hale uh, whistleblow that 90% was not on the intended target, uh, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what, how to feel. Um, so I really started looking into um, the, the war on terror in the Middle East and, and some of the things that we've done over there. And um, I started researching. And that's when I discovered uh, Defend the Guard. And Defend the Guard is a uh, legislative initiative started by a man named Dan McKnight. And Dan McKnight, he was in the Marines, and then he transferred to the uh, Idaho Army National Guard, where he was a sergeant. And Dan McKnight, uh, during Katrina, he had to lead a convoy of Idaho National Guardsmen all the way to Louisiana to take care of that, because the Louisiana National Guard was in Iraq. And the Louisiana National Guard were specific to engineers. And they could have built the dams, the levees, the dikes that could have helped with the disaster relief with Katrina. So he had to make that convoy. And that really started to, to get him going into question. And uh, he started working with another gentleman from West Virginia, uh, Pat McGeehan. 
uh, another uh, service member, former service member. And together, uh, through uh, uh, an organization called bringourtroopshome.us, um, they created Defend the Guard legislation. And this piece of legislation, um, it basically says that national, and this is going to be implemented at the state level. This is not a federal policy. This is state by state because the state controls the National Guard, right? The, the governor of each state is the commander in chief for each National Guard. And so this piece of legislation would basically say that National Guards can't be deployed to overseas conflicts unless Congress formally declares war. And the last time Congress did that, <laughs> And the last time Congress constitutionally declared war was World War II. So it's been a, quite some time. And um, you know, the reason why they don't want to do that is because if they sign their name on declarations of war, then they're accountable to it. And if the people don't find the war popular, then they're going to get voted out. Um, so we've just seen decades and decades of Congress uh, using emergency war measures and, and not doing its job to, and taking accountability. And so I started getting involved with Defend the Guard. Um, you know, it touched me personally. And I, I think that we need to get back to uh, abiding by the Constitution, right? Us National Guardsmen and anyone who served in the military and even the politicians, they took an oath to the Constitution and we should start following it. And, um, you know, uh, we have had tons of support. Uh, the Libertarian Party just recently endorsed uh, defend the Guard initiative. Uh, the Mises Caucus has been championing this, and then we've had lots of support from Young Americans from Liberty. Uh, and uh, Eric, do you want to touch on how like uh, some of these organizations can help us out? Yeah, sure. Well, first, let me kind of uh, I guess reiterate um, some points you've made there. Um, well, and I didn't even realize it was 60 percent. I had heard it was about half, which, which was uh, eye-opening to me. But if it's, even, if it's 60 percent of our active duty troops over in these undeclared wars are our National Guardsmen, it's worth noting, you know, the Constitution's pretty explicit about the circumstances under which the, of course, in the Constitution is called the militia, but today we know that as the National Guard, uh, the circumstances under which the militia can be called forward by uh, the federal government for active duty combat, and that's to suppress insurrection, to repel invasion, or to enforce the laws of the Union. The laws of the Union being a declaration of war. Of course, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, there was never a declaration of war. They could say, well, there was an AUMF that's kind of like a declaration of war. We could have a debate about it. I don't think it qualifies. But you know where we don't have any authorization whatsoever? Like Syria and a lot of these conflicts across the world where, where our men and women in uniform in our state national guards are, are, are serving. Um, I will say, you know, on the history of this legislation, um, you mentioned Dan McKnight and Bring Our Troops Home. They've been doing a tremendous job of organizing this in a way I've never seen before. But there have been scattershot efforts to try to push Defend the Guard in the past. I remember in the state of Maine back in 2012, a state representative who was a mentor of mine put it in and uh, the Republican governor took one look at it and said, well, I don't know, what, what do we do with this? I, I don't, he, he tried to pressure him to drop the bill because it was so problematic and you know, it, um, it um, puts us in an uncomfortable position with the federal government calling them on their unconstitutional bluff. Um, but that's why it's, it's truly um, important legislation. Uh, uh, bring our troops home, organizing this across the many states this last year. It was submitted in something like 40 states this last go around. It didn't pass in any of them. That often happens the first time something is up to bat, but it scared the federal government, which is why the Pentagon sent a four-star general state to state to lobby against this bill, because it would dramatically hamper the federal government's ability not to wage war, but to wage unconstitutional war, to wage undeclared war. And of course, some people might think, well, you know, what's, okay, so Congress declares the war. I mean, that's not hard, except Congress doesn't want to declare the wars because if they have to vote and sign their names to it, 
These wars are unpopular. People know they're unjust. People know that they're immoral, that they're not, we're not giving our troops a clear mission. And so people don't like it. And so if the politicians in Congress have to go on record and vote for it, many of them will lose their reelections. But they don't want to piss off the military industrial complex that's got all these jobs spread out all across, uh, all across their districts. And so they're caught between a rock and a hard place and they say, let's just let the unelected people decide where and when we go to war so that they never have to take accountability for it. Defend the Guard would make Congress ha have to sign their name or the troops do not go. Um, as far as what organizations can do, as you mentioned, Young Americans for Liberty, which um, I was the senior sp uh, spokesperson for Young Americans for Liberty over the last year. I've stepped aside from that, so I'm not representing Young Americans for Liberty here. I'm, I'm just a guy running for state senate in, in the state of Maine for my old state senate seat there. Um, but we do have a national network now of liberty legislators in state capitals across the country who support many things, including Defend the Guard. And I think that we are at an interesting point and we are reaching a kind of critical mass. And I expect in the hypothetical red wave that they say is coming, where we are getting liberty people to win those primaries and ride in on that red wave, I think we are potentially approaching a critical mass where we can really push back and nullify many things, including the wars themselves, from the state level. And Defend the Guard is essential to that. I know, in, and this is a movement that has largely been pushed in advance by people who have fought the wars. Now, I'm the only person up here who has not served in the military, so I don't speak, I speak as someone with legislative experience, not military experience. Um, but so many of the, the, the folks on the ground, the activists advancing Defend the Guard in the States are folks who, who served. I think of a, a, a gentleman I know who um, was the commander of his um, American Legion post in Somerset County, Maine, the biggest American Legion post uh, in his county, who basically spearheaded this effort there, um, put pressure on, on his legis the legislature, got both his county GOP to unanimously endorse Defend the Guard, got his American Legion post to unanimously support Defend the Guard, and then, of course, his state senator was the one who killed it in committee. <laughs> so there's some accountability that has to go on there. That, that's, sadly, that's the process that happens. Until uh, people start losing their re-elections, they don't take it seriously that the people really uh, are gonna hold the politicians accountable there. But, but the, the organization of, and the coalition of legislators we have now from the liberty movement in, in, in states across the country makes uh, Defend the Guard a real threat to the war machine. And I think it is, there is no other issue, perhaps the Federal Reserve itself, which funds the war machine. There is no other issue more important than ending these wars. As Murray Rothbard said, war is the health of the state. And defend the guard is the way we can do it from the state level, rather than the way we've been trying to do it for decades, where we sit around begging Washington, D.C. to come to its senses and stop committing our soldiers to undeclared wars. They're never going to do it, but the states can. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, this is, uh, in my opinion, probably one of the most uh, important pieces of legislation that we can really push forward. And, and, and this can definitely pass, especially in a state like New Hampshire. Um, there's immense momentum for this thing. Uh, the wars are very unpopular. And this is just bringing accountability. And this, this is also um, uh, nullification of, of the wars and, and DC's ability to use our National Guardsmen and our soldiers and our airmen and our Marines and our Naval members to go out and, and to, to fight these unconstitutional wars. And uh, so we actually have a really unique uh, opportunity here. So I met uh, Mitch just this weekend and uh, this week and I discovered that he's from the Illinois National Guard, and uh, I asked him if he wanted to join us on this panel, and I asked him if he wanted to talk on Defend the Guard, and he said, I have no idea what that is. So you're about to get a reaction from someone in the military who is hearing this from the first time. Well, fundamentally, the federal government has 
absolutely zero business being involved in any state's National Guard and or militia, how you define that. And any small step to remove even an ounce of federal power over any state's National Guard is a victory for people who love liberty. Fundamentally, the Guard is supposed to be at home taking care of its own citizens in its own state. I myself have done flood duty in um, southern Illinois. Um, we had massive flooding back in 2019, and there were 20-foot um, levees with water about to break over them, and it was water at your hip on the left side and 30 yards to the right of you at someone's house. Um, we were lucky because at that time, none of our units were deployed, so most of Illinois' guard was available to pitch in, um, and thankfully the levees didn't break. But um, there are plenty of situations where I mentioned earlier, a guard unit gets pulled away completely, leaving its state um, absolutely unoccupied. Obviously, this causes problems um, with disaster relief, um, if there's uh, civil unrest, um, but also if you're ever in a situation where states have more autonomy and the United States is more like the EU and less like one giant country, there may be situations where a state's National Guard unit needs to actually protect itself from something going on with a neighboring state or neighboring country. It's supposed to be the defensive protectorate of that state. Um, and seeing programs like these where we're holding the federal government accountable for the things they make the Guard do, at the very least, is a huge step toward returning that military sovereignty of the guard back to its states where it should be in the first place. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll add something uh, from my experiences of the last two years, both following and working on Defend the Guard efforts in various states. Um, one of the common fears and objections that we hear from state legislatures about this is what if we pass this and the federal government stops using federal dollars to fund our state national guard because the states like in many things have become very dependent on these federal funds if you were here for my talk earlier on tax nullification this, uh, they, ran, they, they steal our money and ransom it back to us with strings attached so that the states do what Washington, D.C. demands, no matter whether it's constitutional or not. And this is a legitimate fear. Now, I know I, I, I've spoken with um, folks at Bring Our Troops Home who, who think this is probably just bluster from the federal government. They probably won't cut off federal funds to a state national guard if they do this. But who knows, they could, they might, it's, it's, it's theoretically possible. But I think it's less likely the more states do this together. Um, one, so when I return to the Maine Senate next year, if I win my race, um, I intend to sponsor Defend the Guard, or if someone else wants to sponsor, I intend to co-sponsor, I tend to support it any single way that I can. One thing I, I think, um, based on the experiences of the last two years of states being afraid to go it alone and risk the wrath of the federal government for challenging their unconstitutional war machine, uh, one idea I've had that I would put in my version of Defend the Guard is a trigger clause. That let's say when 13 states, I like this number 13 because I think it's historically poetic, 13 states have stood up to a tyrannical uh, big government in the past. I think they can do it again. Say, you pass Defend the Guard and you say, this will go into effect when, when Defend the Guard legislation has passed in 13 states. So that way no state is going it alone. No single small state like New Hampshire or Maine has to worry that they're gonna be out there by themselves risking the full wrath of the federal government. When 13 small states stand together, they're not so small anymore. Um, and um, uh, in this way, we can, kind of, we can collectively use state power to, uh, to push back against the federal government. And uh, when a bunch of states are together, it's much less likely that the, state, uh, the federal government will cut off uh, funding to all those states than they would if they would try to just make an example out of one state. Um, that's one thing. And also paired with uh, the 
tax nullification legislation I was talking about previously, we could keep those federal funds they threatened to withhold from us and just use it to fund, fund our own National Guard. Um, but I'm not gonna do a whole spiel on that again. But, uh, but those are some of the objections that I have heard and uh, there are ways to politically combat that like a trigger clause. So what can we do to actually make this happen? How can we get this so we can get Defend the Guard legislation pass in different states, maybe add on, like Eric said, uh, clauses, uh, trigger clauses, that way when enough states pass this, they all go together. Um, the best thing that you can do is just go to uh, defendtheguard.us uh, or uh, bringourtroopshome.us and check out uh, Defend the Guard legislation. Uh, donate to the cause, because that's gonna help us bring uh, people who can testify at different state houses and, and can talk to different uh, state house committees and trying to get and convince these legislatures to pass this bill. Yeah. You know, the politicians, and I say this generally, speaking as a politician, politicians generally, with the exception of some of the really good liberty legislators, which you guys seem to have a pretty big concentration of here in New Hampshire, so good for you guys on that. Uh, but politicians generally aren't going to act on this unless they are more afraid of their constituents than they are of the federal government. Uh, politicians are risk-averse people. They don't like to rock the boat. They want to do just enough to coast to re-election, and doing controversial things in defense of our liberties generally generate controversy and generally piss some people off. Only by contacting your legislators, putting pressure on your legislators, peacefully threatening them. By peacefully threatening them, I mean, we will vote you out of office and I will tell all my friends and family to vote you out of office if you do not vote to defend our sons and daughters in uniform from undeclared unconstitutional wars. And uh, only by putting pressure on them will they, uh, will they do the right thing. It's the same model as how we've passed constitutional carry in state after state across the country. There are plenty of good people in the legislatures who supported constitutional carry because it was the right thing to do. But there, was, there were also plenty of um, unscrupulous politicians who voted for constitutional carry because it was necessary for their political survival. You know, there's an old... Um, uh, I guess a, a principle that Morton Blackwell of the Leadership Institute has illustrated before, which is, you know, there's two theories on how you kind of get things done uh, to restore liberty in, in, in a legislative body. We can do the best we can to try to get all the right people elected who believe all the right things into a majority of positions so that they will vote the right way, or we can shape the political environment around the wrong people to make it politically expedient for them to do the right thing. At the end of the day, whether they vote yes because they believe it, it's the right thing to do, or whether they vote yes because they believe it's the right thing to do for their own reelection. Either way, that's a vote to bring our troops home and end the wars, and I'll take it either way. Uh, can you please raise your hand if you are uh, either currently serving or a veteran of the military? I'm glad you all made it home safe. So, I had a conversation with Scott Horton, the great Scott Horton this morning, and I asked him, how can we get this to pass? And he said the best way to do that is to get our vets in front of the state house legislatures and tell them that you, the, the vets, the service members, want this passed. And when you tell them, hey, I traded rounds in Ramadi, or I was in Bosnia or Serbia or I was in Iraq. They're going to take you seriously. They're going to take yeah. them a lot more seriously than anyone, some Joe, going out and uh, testifying in front of uh, a state legislature. They're going to listen to you and they're going to bow down to you. That's what he told me. Yeah. And uh, I, I think that's uh, an excellent thing. We need to get more uh, veterans involved in this. Uh, if you're not in New Hampshire, go to your, your state and get involved with your, your state's uh, Defend the Guard organizers 
and try and get involved there. Um, later this year, September 11th, we're going to be doing uh, Defend the Guard rallies at uh, State House capitals around the, the country and uh, really try to bring awareness to this issue. And if we just go around to our, our neighbors and our friends and our families and express that this is something that has to pass, this is so important, it's going to happen. Yeah. And when the uh, politicians say, well, what about the federal funds? Ask them, how many pieces of silver are the lives of our sons and daughters in uniform worth for unconstitutional wars? Do you have anything to add, Mitch? No. <laughs> he said it perfectly. I couldn't add anything to that. Do we want to take questions? Yeah, we'll do some Q&A. It's a little bit hard, actually. <laughs> uh, I am a combat veteran in the U.S. Marine Corps, and I served in the um, uh, New York and, and Texas Guard. I, uh, I am very uncomfortable when the back the blue crowd or the thank a vet for his service crowd walks up and wants to thank me for my service. I'm, I'm not very proud of it, uh, frankly. But I do think that this issue has a gravitas that will allow people, with all due respect to politicians that are um, uh, amenable to this, uh, we really need people. We need people that are flying the, black, the, the back the blue flags to, to, to feel this. Um, I'm happy to go to Concord and give my testimony to a politician. That's true, I will, uh, and do everything I can. This is a very important issue. There are lots of logistics to work out in terms of, for what it's worth, legal logistics with the Uniform Code of Military Justice and, re and receiving orders, a governor receiving orders to mobilize state forces under the total force concept. There's a lot of stuff that's probably outside of the scope of this, but until we have people that actually value uh, men and women that go overseas, really value them, um, we have to give them something to, 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 to exercise that. This is a way to do that. And I say that to anybody listening to me, um, if my voice means anything to anybody, that this issue will make a difference. There's a lot of issues that are important. This issue will make a difference because it really brings to the forefront all of the, the state federal cabal conflict that we have. And it actually puts a face, it puts a face on um, loss and cost and how we spend our, our valuable treasure in this, in this country. People, money, all that good stuff. So I want to thank you guys for doing the panel. Um, I'm really excited to hear um, that all the things that are happening, I'm going to get involved myself. And I just really want to encourage everybody that's listened today to to really take this to heart. This is an important issue. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, you know, what, what you said, um, you know, with the, the back to blue crowd, and you know what, we can actually, this is, this is a piece of legislation that can apply to every, that, that can appeal to everybody. We can come from the left, from the left, by saying, this is how you end the wars. This is how you stop the violence in the Middle East. And we can come, from the right, Trump made uh, bringing our troops home popular. He did. And so we can say, well, this is how we can bring our troops home the best, is and by passing this piece of legislation. Yeah. So thank you for that. Tell the right-wingers this is anti-globalist. Tell the left-wingers this is anti-war. And, uh, and for both sides, it's pro our troops and pro our veterans. Mitch? Not to minimize your audience here. I, in fact, I'm one of them. I wouldn't do that. But are you doing anything to reach a larger audience? Like, has defend, a representative of Defend a Guard been on, say, Joe Rogan? I can't remember if they have. I know there's always an effort to get uh, Scott Horton on Joe Rogan. It hasn't happened yet, but I know Dave Smith is trying. Um, okay. But 
Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I haven't heard too much, I mean, you know, other than, you know, I've had, I know Dan McKnight has been on many podcasts, but they tend to be in Liberty Circles, like Tom Wood Show and my podcast and all that. Right. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, it hasn't broken, I don't think it's broken really into the mainstream yet, but that, but it's, it supports building. I don't think we've reached the tipping point yet, yeah. but maybe right. you've got something it, to add to that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. This, this is, um, we now have this piece of legislation, the backing of the third largest political party in the United States, the Libertarian Party. They are officially endorsing this piece of legislation. So yes, we are starting to build some momentum. We're going to get uh, awesome people who can create digital media to run ads and uh, advertising campaigns over social media. We're gonna do our rallies, we're gonna get people involved, we're gonna spread the message, and we're gonna pack the state houses across the country with people who want this passed. Okay. And, and let me add to that too, uh, and, and beyond the support of the Libertarian Party, of course, there are Republican legislators and Democrat legislators in all these states who have sponsored this bill. Wow. So it's, it's, yes. it's um, you know, I love my friends in the Libertarian Party, you know, but of course we also need support from the folks who hold elected office, and we at least need a champion in every single legislative body on the state level across the country. So that's 99 legislative bodies, House and the Senate, with the exception of Nebraska, who's only got one. So we need at least 99 legislators in, uh, in all states from these different bodies to sponsor this bill, put it forward, get the roll call votes, get the politicians on record so that we can, if we don't pass it the first go, uh, the first go around, we can hold the politicians accountable within veteran communities who support this legislation come re-election season, knock a few of those bad politicians out, send a message to the rest of the politicians that if they want to keep their jobs, they better support defending our guard. Well, in, in the vein of a larger audience, while I was listening to you, I got on, on Twitter. If anybody's heard of Clark Howard, he's very supportive of the National Guard. And if you could just tweet to Clark Howard. So uh, following up on what you were talking about, Eric, and with the uh, election season. Yeah. Um, Could I noticed, you get a little closer to the microphone? Yeah, sorry. Uh, I recently filled out my candidate survey for Young Americans for Liberty, and I noticed that they added a question on there for candidates about Defend the Guard. And I was wondering if you knew if they're working with any other uh, organizations like that uh, yeah. to try to start collecting data on, on our candidates. Yeah, well, I know that, um, of course, I, um, when I was the spokesperson for Young Americans for Liberty, um, it's something that I certainly um, encourage very much Yale taking a more definitive position on it. Um, they have, to, to their credit. I know that there is a lot of work with, uh, you know, there's a relationship now with, with Bring Our Troops Home. Uh, which is really spearheading the effort. I mean, that's one of the good things about Yale, Yale as an organization that is kind of uh, general pro-liberty in the Ron Paul mold. It can't focus on every single issue, but there are these great single issue organizations out there that Yale does partner with, whether it's Bring Our Troops Home or National Association for Gun Rights or various various groups that are really the tip of the spear on those single issues that YAL can then come in and support uh, the candidates who are good on those issues with uh, boots on the ground of a activists to go door to door, you know, and help get these candidates elected and then ho help hold them accountable in the, uh, um, you know, that's one of the good things about the YAL model too is they don't just get the people elected. They don't just fill a survey and say, yeah, I believe in all these things, and then the vote happens, and they aren't there for it, or they vote against it, and they don't just say, well, you know, too bad. No, Yal, I, this is one of the things I appreciate about Yal, is someone lies on a survey to get Yal's support. Yal comes back, and they recruit the primary challenger, and they knock that guy out, 
you don't you don't get to steal the support of um, of all these activists and all these donors who want real principled liberty champions and then turn around and uh, and sell people downriver. So it's Matt Pillars there who's with Young Americans for Liberty. <laughs> so. Kind of in the same vein, uh, you know, the Cato does the freedom in the 50 states. And so is this part of, and, you know, I don't have any of their rankings for, I mean, obviously sovereignty is a ranked issue across the country. I don't know if, if that's part of their surveys or not. Yeah. But I've, this seems like something that would really merit attention. And, and I don't have it in front yeah. of me, so I don't know if you guys, and in the same vein, how are, you know, what's your perception across the country? Uh, you know, in state legislatures, is this hot in 10, per, you know, 10 states, 15, 20, or is it, are you just getting started, or, you know, kind of where are you in the scale of ramping up? So, I, th I think this, this past legislative cycle was the first time there was a real nationwide organized effort for this. And so, um, as I mentioned before, there had been scattershot efforts for this. Ten years ago, there was a bill in Maine. There was a bill in West Virginia years ago, but this is the first time there's been a real coordinated effort. Now, I, I don't remember exactly how many states, at least 40 states it was sponsored in this past, uh, th this, this past legislative cycle. Again, it didn't pass in any of them. This is the first real time it came, 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 came forward. But the important thing of the first time you get a bill in is you can work to get a roll call vote you put the politicians on record, and now you've got something you can beat them up with in general election season uh, during their re-election or primary season. I, anyway, election season generally. Uh, and even, even if they get beat up and they win their re-election, they'll always remember getting beat up for this. And all the pol they'll think twice, and the other politicians will think twice, say, boy, I don't want to go through that. I don't want to get beat up over that again. I don't want to have angry veterans calling me a traitor to the Constitution and, you know, a, uh, someone who's stabbing them in the back and have mailers and everything go out against me. Maybe I should support Defend the Guard. Yeah, you don't want to be that politician that did not defend the Guard. Yeah. You really don't. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Question. First of all, thank both of you for your service. Really appreciate it. Well, thank you for your taxes. I appreciate it. Um, question I have is kind of maybe a little bit off topic, but I guess for a lot of us, can you help us to understand, like, why is it that the U.S. government is relying so heavily on the National Guard to be overseas fighting the wars? When, I mean, is it a pay thing? Is it a, are you held to a different set of code that maybe a regular enlisted man isn't? Yeah, sure. So um, there's a few different types of deployments that uh, different uh, codes for deployments. There's Title 10, Title 32. And so, uh, so usually uh, overseas deployments are Title 10. And so this type of deployment the uh, Department of Defense, they'll put out a list of units that they want to throw together to, to form a, some sort of ad hoc division to go over to the Middle East. They attach National Guard units to, let's say, 10th Mountain Division or to the 82nd. And so they put out a list of all these different units. And uh, so uh, each state National Guard usually has a specialization, right? So New Hampshire's artillery, Vermont is infantry, uh, Massachusetts has a lot of special forces units. Uh, Tennessee is tanks and armor. Um, Louisiana is engineers. Uh, California has a lot of aviation units. So there's a, the, each state usually has specializations in what kind of National Guards that they have. So the DOD will put out a list of what they want for a deployment. And uh, sometimes governors, uh, but mostly uh, TAGs, uh, attorney, the, uh, the adjutant generals of the National Guard for each state uh, will volunteer their unit to go out. And, uh, you know, that also goes into a lot of um, politics within the military. You want to make your boss look good so he gets promoted, and when he goes up, he takes you with him. So um, the adjutant generals, they'll try and make themselves look good. 
um, by volunteering their National Guards to go on these deployments. And so that's why we do have a lot of National Guard going overseas, is because there is a lot of politics within the military upper echelon. Do you have anything to add? Well, it's not exactly on this question, but just the thing I think about this whole time while discussing, you know, deployments and, and whatnot. Um, I can tell you right now, um, across the majority of the military, especially the National Guard, um, there is a massive retention problem. I was at a drill a few months ago. We had two soldiers I knew personally, one of whom actually helped drive my stuff out here when I moved here three weeks ago, so that guy really helped me out. Thank you, thank you. Um, both of them uh, were doing their last drill, and in the big formation, the big goodbye, you know, huddle, uh, two of the senior NCOs were asking them, you know, you can, you can still re-up, you can still sign the paperwork, you know, you can come back in, but there have been a whole bunch of just random nonsense throughout that entire drill, and I'm like thinking to myself, you know, if you want them to stay in at the micro level, you know, the, these small hiccups are what get people out of, you know, service. But at a much broader level, there is a retention problem, and if you want to keep people in, you have to treat them with respect. If we want to have a free state, especially without a draft, then you have to incentivize people to actually want to stay in and serve. And you don't do that by disrespecting their service, by sending them to go fight wars that we have no business being in in the first place, but especially taking them from their own state. I, I personally find it very interesting that, um, I know this is a little off topic as well, but there was a recent debate in Congress over legislation to expand the draft, to include women in the draft. Uh, it actually passed the House of Representatives. It looked like it might have, was going to pass the U.S. Senate. Um, thankfully, it failed in the U.S. Senate at the last moment. But I just found it fascinating, the floor speeches from some of these members of Congress, Republicans and Democrats both, who were supporting this, somehow was promoting gender equality by taking away a woman's right to choose whether or not to join the military since women already can enlist voluntarily. Uh, and of course, for many people, they say, well, you know, it's a symbolic thing. The draft hasn't really been in active use since the, 19, since, uh, since, since the Vietnam War. Thank you to Milton Friedman uh, for uh, helping to bring an end to that. The liberty movement has made some big impacts on, uh, on fighting wars. Uh, fighting against the wars, and the, and, the, and the draft in particular. But what was interesting was just so many of these speeches, like members of Congress, like fantasizing out loud about a future conflict in which everyone is needed, men and women and black and white and gay and straight. It's like, I'm all for inclusion and equality and all that, but what you're talking about is like equal slavery under the law, you know? How about we have equal freedom under the law? Um, but... It, but I think it does get to this point, and I think you see this more and more, the military is having retention problems, they're having recruitment problems. I, I, you know, we could kind of theorize about what all the contributing factors of that are, but I think a large part of it is, is, is the rose-tinted glasses falling off and people realizing the way that the men and women in our military have been outrageously abused these last 20 years in the war on terror, fighting wars with no clear mission, uh, where you know, people are where uh, even even the promises of taking care of people when they come home with with uh, with injuries and and trauma are just completely um, our, our soldiers are just completely left to rot. Um, you know, it's just crazy to me. You know, if we don't have the money to take care of the soldiers who fight the wars, in my mind, that means we don't have the money to fight the wars. Um, so, you know, maybe that has something to do with the retention problem and the recruitment problem the military is having. And perhaps if the states actually asserted that the wars have to be constitutionally declared and Congress have to have, has, uh, have to have at least enough skin in the game to sign their names to it, perhaps we would not so casually send our troops to war and the military would not be having recruitment problems. And just um, jumping off of that, while we're talking about things that um, the National Guard should not have to deal with, by default, the governor is the commander-in-chief of the National Guard unit in his state. Whenever the president wants a National Guard unit to do something, they're paid out of a different basket of money, but they're put on orders, like Derek mentioned. And 
the entire National Guard, both Army and the Air Force side, was required to get vaccinated by presidential order. Um, the president did not activate the National Guard or pay them even for one day to give this order, which was completely uh, unacceptable. So um, chipping away at powers uh, like sending the National Guard overseas without declaring war will have secondary benefits and open the door for things like preventing the president from making every single guardsman get vaccinated against their will. I know all about that. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you do. <laughs> all righty. Uh, we're going to go ahead and wrap up. Um, I do think that this is a very important piece of legislation, and the way that we can get it passed is if we all go out and we all just start talking about it. And I'll leave with uh, Ron Paul. There's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come, and I do believe that it's time to end the wars, bring our troops home, and defend the Guard. And the wars end the Fed. Let's do it. <laughs>